you guys up here and let you look thoroughly through the kits and explain how to set stuff up and make sure you guys really understand what's going on. I feel like this, is this the lecture he gave yesterday? It all changed. Oh, so that's why he needs to give it. I might let him actually give this then. I thought he was just going to do the central lines. He's really doing all the tubes. Every tube there ever was. Let me see his ETA. All right. Video call, I'll stop that. Phone. Well, they're not like, I mean, they play like college. They're not, 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 they're not
work out every day. I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're, I mean, they're, yeah. they're athletes. Yeah, but they're not like. All right, guys, sorry I'm late. Um, so this is not really, I don't mean for this to be a lecture at all. It's about clearing confusion and making sure you guys ask all the questions, uh, obviously mostly geared towards the interns. Um, there's a lot of lines, drains, tubes that we use, and people ask you about it. It's important that you know the difference between them, why we use one versus the other. Um, and so let's just get right into it. Um, I haven't looked at this PowerPoint in a while, so we'll we'll make do. Um, so Penrose drain, y'all know what a Penrose drain is? So it's this one right here at the bottom. Um, we'll put those in. Um, you see them a lot more on the peed side, but we use them. It's just a way to allow the wound to keep draining around it. So there's no bulb. There's no connection to it. It's just, it's just passive drainage um, out. Okay, usually they're stitched in place. That said, uh, that means that they always they come out pretty often. They'll slip out or the stitch will pull through, but um, that's just all that is. Um, the closed drains, the ones that you'll see the most are the JP drains, Jackson Pratt's and the Blake drains. Um, basically, it's one of these. Uh, these are flat drains instead of versus round drains. So little holes in here. Um, you'll that obviously stick in the, whatever cavity you put that in, usually in the abdomen. Uh, remember, there's a black hole. There's a black hole it's usually be around here or somewhere. Um, that that's the sentinel hole so if you're distal to that that means if that hole is outside of the abdomen that means that you probably have a gonna have a leak because one of the other holes is gonna be outside of the cavity um, so you won't be able to hold suction or anything uh, so when you put those in the OR whenever just make sure that black hole is inside whatever spot um, you're putting it in um, oh interrupt me if you have any questions um, the JP bulb, the way you squeeze it, the way you charge it is this way, sideways, like a little grenade, okay? You'll see nurses do little fancy things where they'll push it from the bottom and make it look real pretty, like a little pyramid. It looks real cute. It doesn't work that way. Um, um, I, I'll be glad to set up a little experiment to prove that to you. But it doesn't work that way, um, so it make sure it's, it's squeezed this way, okay? Some attendings, like Dr. Dowden's, the one that comes to mind, does not squeeze his JP drains. So if you come across a drain of one of Dr. Dowden's patients, um, and it's not squeezed, don't just go and squeeze it, you know, ask. Um, so some attendings do like them just to gravity. Um, the Hemovax, you'll see those on, on your trauma rotations. Ortho really is the one that uses them more. They basically look like a little flattened accordion. Um, they would work exactly the same as JP drain. It's just a little negative pressure. Um, uh, Anybody know how much pressure you generate from a JP that's squeezed? Like yeah, it's a lot. So it's a lot. Yeah, like the, the little ones are, can go be as high as usually about somewhere between like 130 and 160. Um, the bigger JP drains are about 80, so they actually have less pressure. Uh, so, um, you know, Dr. Smith likes to say you don't suck in the bowel, but when you put like a, a, a negative pressure wound dressing on, on something and you set it to 40, on the, you know, on the wall, but really when you put one of these, it's like 160. So just be mindful of that. Um, when you're taking them out, don't forget to remove it from suction, okay? That's, it, it's, it's really important. It's, it's happened many times where people just pull them out when it's charged and then a little piece of momentum just comes right out with the drain. And, and now you have, you just created a nice little hernia. It's not good. And if it's momentum, you're lucky, I and mean, it could be worse. So uh, always remember, take them off suction. Um, sump drain, X, aka NG tubes. Um, so 
One thing I'll say, make sure you're all familiar with how to put an energy tube and putting them in. Um, a lot of times you have to do that to expedite the care of your patients. You can't just wait for the nurses to put them in. Um, so if you're not comfortable doing them, start doing them, get comfortable. Um, these things, uh, important thing for all to know, so if, uh, and I, I don't know how much y'all know about this, that's why I'm saying all, all of these things, but these have two lumens. So there is a main lumen kind of like right here, and that's just where the gastric contents come back out of. And then you have this blue uh, um, lumen here, and it's, it's a much smaller lumen that goes along the side of that. Does anybody know what that is for? Hmm? Yes. Yeah, so venting. So that allows air to recirculate, and it keeps it from getting stuck to the, to the gastric wall or the small bowel wall, wherever it is. Um, so what that means is if that, to, if that gets clogged or tied off, if that happens, then you don't have that, and then you, it'll just get stuck to the side wall, and then the NG tube doesn't work. So sometimes if you come in and overnight and your patient, you know, they tell you that the patient uh, only had 50 cc's from his NG tube, you know, and you go in there and he's like hiccuping and his stomach is this big, then you want to you know, assess the NG tube, and that's one of the things you want to do is take this little, um, if it's calved, just remove it. Um, you can flush air through the blue port, just air, uh, and that'll help you know, kind of release it from a, if it's stuck to the sidewall. Um, you can flush them, do whatever you need to to get them working. Um, this little piece at the end, this is a filter, okay? And this is a one-way uh, one valve. So it, air can come out through here, come out, and then it'll go through this blue piece. And there's a filter that sits right there, okay? Um, and there's little holes on the, the side of this white side, uh, on the white side over here. And it just lets the air through. But what that means is if, if water comes in here, gastric juices come in here, and they get this far, they'll clog that filter. Um, and then this doesn't work. Likewise, if the nurse f removes this little piece and then puts the white piece, the white end, to the blue tube, then this is, like I said, it's a one-way valve, so it doesn't work. Uh, so if you come in, you make sure the blue is to blue. If there's f fluid in here, just either take off the take off the little filter completely or um or just find a new one find a new one and replace it um so we got chest tubes so we'll we'll, we'll kind of i think it'll be better just with the kits that we have we'll, we'll talk about chest tubes more specifically but just know that there's a bunch of different sizes um the this is a troll car so a lot of times in when you get them in the you know, ER, they'll have this troll car in them. Um, I don't use the troll car to place, place them. It makes me nervous. Um, they use them a lot on the Pete side. Um, it's like this giant spear, a little baby. It just makes, it'll make you real nervous. Um, like I said, they, they also have a last drainage hole, and they're usually marked by there's a, a radiopaque line that has a break in it. And where that break is, that corresponds to the last hole on that chest tube. So when you look at a chest x-ray with the chest tube, always verify that that last hole is in the chest, especially if you have an air leak. If you have an air leak, make sure that it's not just because your hole is outside the chest and, and it's just sucking air out from the, from the outside world. Um, uh, everybody understand how like the little Pluravac containers work, the chest tube container with the air seal, water seal, what all that means? Yes? All right. Um, Again, so this is the Pluravac. Um, come in every morning, you see these chest tubes. Um, always have the patient cough, or if they don't want to cough, you can ask them to take a deep breath. That'll sometimes work. Um, you'll see little bubbles if there's an air leak, okay? And it'll be usually be like a couple of the bubbles, a little. Sometimes when people take a deep breath, they go, <sighs> and they'll do that. It'll cause a little ball to go up and splash, and it looks like a bubble. But it's not really. So you wanna, you you'll see kind of with just normal breathing, it's like little bubbles here and there, here and there, um, and that's kind of what that really looks like. Uh, never ever clamp a chest tube. Again, everything comes a little star because unless you're on peds, and, and you have a Dr. Kelly's or Dr. Bro Charles patients, they will clamp them. Um, uh, so, any of y'all taking chest tubes out? Yeah.
You know what, Rossio? Just disconnect it from the wall session. Okay. Okay. Just nothing on the box. You have to t change. Okay. Uh, you have this little knob that shows the pressure. Pretty much, ninety-five percent of the time or more, it's gonna be at twenty. I mean, just leave it there. You never touch that. So the wall suction doesn't matter. So the yeah, you can you can turn the wall suction to the max. It won't matter. The the suction on on the chest tube is controlled by this container. Okay. okay? Uh, so that's an important thing, and it has to be on continuous suction. So make sure it's continuous suction. Doesn't matter what it's set on, it'll be controlled by this. When you're putting a water seal, you literally just disconnect it. Basically, the suction will be hooked up to right here. Um, you just disconnect it from that. Important is to communicate that with, to the nurse and to write a note, uh, write an order on Epic for that, because you'll come around to take it off. The nurse will come and see it's off. She'll think that somebody disconnected and she'll put it back on. So make sure that it's communicated so that when you come with Dr. Smith later, he doesn't say, why are, why are we still on suction? You know, so um, important things to remind um, When you take the uh, chest tube out, I think the most important thing, like almost everything we do, is to be prepared before you do it. So have everything you need next to you. Um, well, I wish you guys were here for a really great M&M &M last year, um, but the have the tape cut for you ready, have the the gauze, just everything open and to your availability, okay? Don't rely on somebody else to get it for you. Have it all ready, because the last thing you wanna do is take the tube out and then realize you don't have tape. And now uh, you have a one hand, put it on the hole, try and, you know, where you just pull the tube and, and then you have one free hand and the tape's not even near you. That's not a situation you want to be in. Um. <laughs> yeah, y'all know what I'm laughing about. I just can't. Uh, yeah, don't 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 put yourself in that situation. Um, so just make sure you have everything. Take your time. Uh, basically, take the dressing down, um, cut the stitch. Um, I would say before you even do any of that, is practice with the patient. Tell them what you're gonna do. Tell them this is what your role is gonna be. Okay, and that's gonna be you know. You could either do it full inspiration or full expiration. Um, I, I judge it. I do both, and it just depends on whatever I think the patient's going to do easier. Um, and you just kind of get a feel with that. Some whatever they seem to be following, com like following along easily, easiest with. And then you you pull it quickly. Okay, make sure it's off suction. Again, really important, off suction. Um, you don't have to yank it out, but just nice, gentle tug. Okay, don't just sit there and, and you know slowly. Um, and then so one hand pulls and one hand has a gauze with um, zero form on it. And the moment that holds, you just cover it up, keep your hand on it, and then get the tape, okay? I would say at this point, always, you know, it's easier if you have an extra set of hands. It, it just makes your life a lot easier to do these. Um, let me see. Do, do. Uh, chest x-ray, you can get them. Um, it's kind of... A, depending on who, who you talk to, when you get it. Some, sometimes if the patient's gonna stay there anyways, you can just get one the next day unless there's a change. Um, but that's just kind of, you, you, you can be safe and always get one an hour later, that's fine. Um, we don't need to go into that. Uh, see, there's anything else on chest tubes you guys can think of? Removing them? Any issues you've had? Yeah. We had a case where some like chest tube kind of got stuck in the middle of the like, Your senior will probably just come in on it harder, but if you're just uncomfortable anyway, please just call somebody to help you. Uh, that's a definitely good point. Yeah, they they should just slide right out. Um, I feel like there was something else I wanted to say about that. Sort of. Sometimes. So sometimes yeah. we'll do it depending on how fast we're trying to get this yeah. out. So uh -huh. we'll order the chest x-ray sometimes the next morning. If, we, if it's already like 7 p.m., we know they're going to be here till the morning, and there were no problems pulling out that chest tube, we'll just order it for the morning uh, rather than getting like some midnight chest x-ray. But if it's some trauma patient that's been sitting here for days and you're like, we're over it, we pull the chest tube early in the morning, get the film by like noon.
point. Um, and, you know, you can go, there's a lot more, you can talk about this, but um, for sake of time, you know, as far as like also like, you know, some people need stitches, most people don't, some do. If they're really skinny, um, but you'll, you'll learn that as you go. All right, so feeding tubes, um, all sorts of names for them. Uh, so a peg, um, it, it's, it, it's just a peg. It's a tube in the stomach that we do put endoscopically. It's percutaneous, so there's no incision. Um, you know, you don't you don't make an incision on the stomach. You basically just pull the tube through. Um, you'll see plenty of pegs, plenty of experience with them. Um, the important thing, the big thing about pegs is if a peg comes out in the first few weeks, it, it can be a big deal. Um, so if you get called and you know somebody, um, it's not rare you get a call from medicine and they'll tell you, hey, this this person got a peg by GI three days ago. It came out like 12 hours ago, but you know we just wanted to see if you guys would look at it. And you, so that's not okay. Like that's you need to go see it right away because you can have spillage of gastric contents into the abdomen. Okay, if the stomach falls away. So a peg that comes out a month, two months after it was placed, it's not a big deal. You just go in, you go back there and put it back in. Basically, you can either put a foley back in or you can put a uh, just go get like an actual gastrostomy tube from the OR, and you can put those in. Um, you know, the first time you do it, just make sure you talk to a senior, talk to somebody who's done it, um, get help. But, uh, um, yeah, if they call you about a peg that's recently placed within, I would say, especially within the first two weeks, and they call you about it, go see that right away. Make sure a person doesn't have peritonitis. Make sure they don't need an operation right away. Um, a peg, PEG, or you'll hear them called, uh, it's basically just a peg that has a, a separate limb that goes, it's snaked down into the jejunum uh, for distal feeds. Uh, it's the only difference with that. Uh, a red Robinson catheter is that a red rubber catheter? Is that what that is? I don't know what the hell that red. Ro I don't know. I don't know what red Robinson catheter is. Um, uh, a Malincott. So I wish there was a picture. There's not a picture of it here. I'm not sure it's listed here. But Malincott is not. Very, it's not. It's not really a feeding tube. Um, it's just a. Uh, it's. It's like a. What is it made? It's elastic. I don't know what the hell it's made out of. But it's a. It's like a stretchable little tubing that has a little little bulb at the end um, and then you put it in a, if you have a usually an official tract or some sort of um, um, official tract you want it to seal around it you can put the end of it because it has a little bulb at the end it'll it'll kind of stay in place they get pulled out all the time um, so be very careful they're very easy to pull out um, dop off y'all know where dop off is yeah so it's just a feeding tube it's a little tiny feeding tube so important things with dop off you can you can put medications through it, you can feed through it, you can't aspirate through it. So if somebody has, uh, you know, they, they have, a, all of a sudden they have an ileus or something and, and they need decompression, do not try to suck stuff out from through their dop off, it won't work. You'll just clog it, so don't even try. If they need, if they're distended and they have the stomach's huge, you just need to put an, an NG tube in. Um, the, if you ever hear like somebody needs a post pyloric dop off, the nurses in the ICU can do that. Um, really, you can do it too, but you know, just let them do it. But basically, they just use like this little machine that tracks where the tip of that. Um, it uses kind of like it just locates on a on a monitor where the tip of that cath of the of the tube is, and then you can snake it into the duodenum and make sure it's past the pylorus. Um, that's all that is. Um, and then the MIC, the, these MIC gastrostomy tubes. You'll see this really on peds. Um, I don't, I, I don't even know what's so special about them, but it's, it, it's just, it's basically the same thing, except there's no tubing that comes out. It's just flush at the skin, and there's like a little port, and it opens, and then they feed through that. Um, that's the main difference, is there's not like an actual tube that sticks out in like, you know, a few inches. Um, all right, so pegs. Uh, really important, so, you, you know, especially on, you have trauma, you have these people that are here forever, they get a peg, you're, you know, you know, a few months into this, you'll be like, well, just, it's just a peg, you, they're, it's fine, okay? You gotta look at that daily, especially the first few days. There's a lot of things that can happen with pegs. Um, uh, it's important, try to, if you do a case for a peg, make sure you note in your operative note where it was at the skin at the end of the surgery, okay? So it was at three centimeters, four centimeters, just always write that in there because when you come back the next day, either yourself or somebody else, and now it says six centimeters, or now it says two centimeters, and you know that there was a change, and, and at that, it's not, it moved, okay? And it needs to, 
uh, be fixed. You got to look at that daily. You got to look at the surgical site daily. They rarely get infected, but when they do, it's pretty nasty and they can't get, it's pretty, pretty bad. I mean, we had a, when I was on trauma, uh, my team, we had a patient got a peg and he was, uh, he was one of those traumas. He was ready to go. He was waiting for site placement. He was there forever. And he had that foam tape over the peg site and nobody looked at it. Nobody took that foam tape down. And about two weeks later, he started having fevers. White count was going up. Couldn't really figure out where it was coming from. And then like, oh, let the peg, let, let's take off this foam dressing. We don't know how long it's been there. And his whole skin under that was basically like all wet and gangrenous and disgusting and sloppy and this pus everywhere. Um, and that's just because nobody took that dressing down. Nobody looked at it. Uh, so it's a big learning point. So definitely you got to look at them. A um, couple of things that happen um, is that, so this is kind of what you have the, the part that's in the stomach, so it's like a little bumper, and you have the external bumper, okay? And then you have the whole abdominal wall and the stomach included in that. Um, if you tighten it too much, it can cause, this bumper can cause necrosis because it, it basically restricts the blood flow to this part of the stomach. It'll cause necrosis, the stomach wall, and then this will erode through the stomach wall and into the abdomen, and then that's really bad. Um, that's a bad problem. You can have leakage at that point into the sub-Q. It, it, it's a really, really bad problem. So that's why knowing how deep this thing is is important. Um, you'll see nurses will love to, the, these things leak around them, right? And they don't like that, so they'll put dressing sponges underneath this bumper. They'll just stuff it under there to catch the drainage. But what that does, it increases this pressure. Um, so if you come around, there's like a bunch of sponges stuck under this, take them out. Okay, just take them out and t let them know that, that to please not do that. Uh, urinary catheters, um, you'll get, I, I guess, are we still doing urology? Are we still doing that? Yeah. All right, so you'll, you'll, you'll get plenty of experience placing catheters. I, I would encourage you to um, place as many Foley's as you can, do as many things in the OR as you can in that rotation so that you're never the person that calls urology for a difficult Foley, that they just come in and just they just put a Foley in. Don't, don't do that. Um, Foley, that's just a regular one we use. A coude basically has a, a, a tip that's, that's firm and it's kind of tilted up. Okay, a coude is really helpful for getting, if somebody has BPH and it's real tight, um, basically the, the tip goes up and you just slide it in with constant pressure and it'll usually be able to kind of get through that stenosis and the, through the prostate. Um, and all of these obviously come in a bunch of sizes. And there's a lot of other different types of urinary catheters, but Foley and, and Coudet are the main ones you need to know. A temp Foley is just a regular Foley that has a, a little temperature um, gauge that can hook up to the monitor. You see them in the ICU. Um, so when you pull out a Foley, you, you always, the big thing you worry about is that they can have urinary retention. So usually if they haven't peed within six hours, usually five or six hours, and they have to be straight cast. Um, they can bladder scan them and uh, do all those things. I uh, won't get into any more details on that, I don't think. All those patients Yeah. Yeah, everybody, if, if you have your nerve retention, it's just Flomax. Flomax for everybody, they love it. Uh, all right, what do we got here? Central lines, all right. Um, so central lines, we use them all the time. Most patients in ICUs have them, you, and there's a lot of really good reasons to have central lines. I think TPN for you know traumas. I need you know they have multiple drips going. Um, if they're getting prolonged IV antibiotics, um, a lot of the things that you need central lines for can be replaced by uh, a pick line. Uh, pick line carries much less risks both with ins with insertion and long term. So if somebody's if it's 2 p.m. and they, you know, they just they need more access and go with the t go with the pick line. Um, the you will from time to time get called about some medicine patient or, or the nurse saying they need a central line they, because because it's hard to la draw labs. Okay, that's not a reason to do a central line. Um, there's so if you get called about putting in a central line, always always know why you're doing it. Make sure there's not another alternative that they just haven't thought about. Um, because um, nothing we do is benign. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with putting a central lines. Um, and if you're going to put one in, always make sure you look at their coags. Make sure, check if they have cultures, you know, if they have positive blood cultures or 
or whatnot, something that, that is going to make them uh, more set up for infection. Um, let me see. So there's a, a lot of different types of lines, a lot of different names for essential lines. Um, the main ones we deal with, I'll talk about those. The vas cath, that's the big dialysis catheter, might be in one of these. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so it's just, a, it's just a big double lumen. It's a 14 French double lumen central line um, for dialysis, okay? The preferred spot is the right IJ. That's number one. If, for whatever reason, you can't go in there. Left IJ is okay. Last is the groin. If you're doing a left IJ, the big, the important thing is to get a really long catheter. If you use a 20, you got to hub it. You got to hub it all the way so that I make sure the best spot is at the cable atrial junction. If it's not there, sometimes the dialysis won't work. Um, they'll have trouble with their volumes and their flow. And um, uh, we do have the 24s uh, for groins. You, you can put them in the neck if it's a large person. If it's a really big giant person, you can put a 24 on the for the left side. Yeah, you gotta, you know, those are the ones you gotta be careful of them. Yeah, because I mean, you can you can put that through somebody's heart. When you go far enough. Yeah. So do you need like get a chest X-ray before you sutured it in or everything? No, no, no. Like, no. Look at this person's body habits and they look insane. Like you can you can measure you can you can kind of measure you, you can get like a rough idea of what they need. Um, You'll start to look. Yeah. The more you in, yeah. Like, oh, this is a very tiny lady. I will tell you, keep in mind, just keep in mind that you can always pull back a catheter. You can't put it back in. Yeah. You can't push one back in, okay? But, but you can always pull it back. So if you get the extras too far, you just pull it back. But, um, so oh, sir, why can't you put a vast catheter so crazy? Why? So it depends who you ask. You can. You can definitely do yeah, it. You can do it. You can do it. Some people some people some people do it. But so So it's a fourteen French it's a fourteen French. So you're talking it's bigger than this tubing. It's a big ass hole. And how well can you hold pressure on a subclavian? Not good, right? You have a clavicle rise. You can't hold good pressure. Huh? Yeah, you can't hold pressure and you know God forbid you 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 know you 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 dilate the artery or something, then you're you're in a big problem. So yeah, the um, never in the subclavian. Don't ever put a fast calf in the subclavian. Also, subclavian is smaller and you can yeah. stenosis. Central stenosis yep. being there for contrafascia. Yes, yeah, so there if there are dialysis patients, the rate of central stenosis is much higher if you put in a subclavian. Um, uh, I recently, you know, like I said, right IJ, left IJ preferred. I recently did one. Um, one of the worst vast cast experiences of my life, and it was uh, I ended up I, I ended up uh, uh, putting in in the the groin uh, after we messed around a little bit, but in, uh, that's not the one I was thinking about. That was just in my mind. But there's no one. Their INR was like seven. They're very coagulopathic. They they just needed a vast calf. So I put in the groin first. I didn't even look at the because if you have a big bleed here, it's easier. If you have a bad bleed in the neck, bad things happen. Bad bleed in the groin. I mean, it, it sucks, but but it'll be okay. Did but you guys bring a vast cath kit today? Just no. Just now. no. Okay. When you guys ask for a vast cath, there is so when you're doing ports, there's a little um, sheet that you do when you put the catheter in the port and you peel away the sheet. There is something similar in the vast cath kit, but it does not have any sort of diaphragm to keep that patient from bleeding out. It is basically a drinking straw that you slam into their central circulation and when you put that thing in it is just going to go so you have to be ready that's kind of a have somebody there with you if, you, if it's left you only use that as a last resort i've only used it once it was with chris bell i'll never use it again it's like <laughs> the worst possible case scenario is what you have so don't be aware of what that is and that you have it but you should not be using it ever by yourself what is it? it is so the gray thing that's in the vast cap it's a, it's a peel away sheet, yeah. and it, there's no diaphragm on it to keep it from back bleeding. When would you use that? When, if you can't get the vast cap to thread it, we had literally gone through like four glide wires, like uh, all the wires kept bending, the subcutaneous tissue was too fibrosed, and so this just makes it, it's a tunnel, yeah. it's there and it's rigid, so you yeah. put it in there and you pull it out and it threads into the tube, like it threads into the tube. 
Uh, and you put the, the actual bad cat in, in the bag. In the water. But and then while peel it's away. like that. But while it's, it's just, it's everywhere. It's, not like it's the just a tube. Where it's, you're, yeah. Like, okay. Your wire is out, so it's just the hole. It's just the hole. Like, yeah. Oh, you could probably. Don't use that. I'm going to do that. <laughs> Um, do y'all know what the difference between a vast cap and a perm cap is? Yeah, I didn't need it for a long time, and, and it's very simple. So vast cap, perm cap, you look at it from the outside, it looked exactly the same. You're like, oh, I don't know the difference. The difference is the perm cap has a, a few centimeters that's tunneled under the skin, and then it has a little cuff at the end. Um, so the, it has a lower risk of infection because it's, it doesn't come out directly on top of the vein. So, it, it, so it'll go into IJ, tunneled over the clavicle, kind of like a port, and it'll come out. Okay, and it has a little cuff at the end um, to kind of let it scar in place. That's the only difference between them, okay? So we put those in the operating room. We don't put them at bedside, but we, you, you can remove them at bedside. Um, and then if you ever have to do that, you know, just get somebody who's done it before. It's pretty straightforward. Again, as long as you set up everything, you kind of know what to expect, what complications you plan on getting into. Um, they're not too bad to take out usually. You but can also remove a port at bedside. You can. Or you can. I, I've done that, and it was a nightmare. It's not, um, but yes. You, so, um, so that's the only difference of perm calf, um, you know, because most a lot of people in the hospital don't know what the difference between a perm calf and vas calf is, and that's you know, perm calf think longer term, vas calf is just get them through this submission, get them through the next few days of dialysis. That's that's it. If someone's going to go home, they need a perm calf. You can't go home with a vas calf because um, that's a high infection rate. Um, Hickman, Hahn, all these right here, these are all central lines that are tunneled. That's all they are. It's not, you know, they'll talk about it, they'll make them sound like it's a big deal, but it, it's just a central line that's just like a perm cat. It's tunneled, it comes out into the skin. Um, that's it. Um, again, you see them more on kids than you do on adults. Uh, you all know what a port is. Um, uh, so triple lumen, double lumen, just a little principle to keep in mind. The more lumens you have, the smaller those lumens are. So a quad lumen line sounds like it's really great, but it's it's really small little little uh, lumens on it. So so it's really hard if you if you need to get if anything at any reasonable rate, it's hard to push it through those. Um, so triple lumen, double lumen. Um, I usually just go with the triple. Um, nothing. Yep. Yeah, nothing there. Just because he was talking about pulling those things out too. Nothing there. The same rules apply if like. For what? Putting what? You're talking about pulling them out. Putting what up? Like you're gonna pull out a perm cap. Oh inside, yeah. And you meet a lot of resistance even after you like dissect out the subcutaneous tissue and everything. Yeah. Just also, stop. Yeah, yeah. You can break those in half, and then that person has to go yeah. to the OR to get that fished out with like a wire. Or yeah. So yeah, I don't don't. Yeah, you, they did. You some they do take some tugging to get out, but. Theoretically, you, you, you'll you get a feel for how much it's too. So this is the cuff that I was talking about. So this should be right under right uh, under where the skin where it exits, um, and it just allows the, the sub -Q tissue to scar into it. So obviously, the longer it's been in there, the harder they are usually to get out because there's more scarring. Um, if it's only been there for a couple of weeks, usually just slide right out. Uh, ports, these are what it looks like. Nothing to talk about there. Yeah. Yeah, there and and there's we'll show you on the yeah. You guys, if you need an extra ten or fifteen minutes to go through those kits, yeah. take it. I'll let the chiefs know. Yeah, okay. Sounds good. Uh, that's ports. You know about ports. This is the little access kit for ports. Um, um, the nurses on the floor will not access ports. Even the ICU, I don't think they will access the ports. You know, um, if you're in a trauma situation or somewhere, somebody has a port and they're crashing and they need access, just stick the port. Like just get get the damn needle and you stick it. Even if they're like, oh, we can't do it, just do it. Like it's an access, it's a central line basically what they have in there. So 
Um, but you know, you don't routinely use a port for lab draws or things like that. Cause I mean, that's what they, especially if they're actively on chemo, that's, they need that. So try to preserve them. Um, all those complications, central lines, it, this seems like a lot of things and it, a lot of these probably are very, very, very low, but all of these things can happen and, and will happen. So that's just to remind you that it's not just the central line. It's not, you know, even if you've done, you know, hundred of them, it's still something you got to keep in mind. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. Pneumothorax, bleeding, those are the main ones, obviously. Um, so just keep that in mind. When somebody calls and tells you, oh, this person needs a central line, you know, I always ask yourself, do they actually need a central line? Um, so th th I'll just touch on this. This one, has someone already attempted a line? This is really relevant in the M medical ICU. If you get a consult from the medical ICU for putting in a central line, that should raise a huge red flag because they try to put in all their central lines. So if they're calling you, that means that they've tried in multiple locations. They've probably stuck the artery already. They've probably still if that happens, you know, before you even do anything, get the ultrasound, look, get a chest x-ray, make sure they haven't dropped along already um, because you will, uh, you know, if somebody has a difficult access, you know, if somebody's already tried, then that, that should prompt you that this is not going to be a straightforward thing. Um, always make sure you have consent for putting a central line and always try to have coax if, if available. Uh, da -da. So... Uh, non-emergent central line vascaf, whatever you're doing, you take your time, you've gone up, you, you, you spend, you should spend, honestly, you should spend more time setting everything up and preparing than you actually doing it. A lot, like probably double the time, okay? Um, you want to do this as sterile as possible. If you're in a trauma bay, you get a betadine, you throw it on there, you try to get some sterile gloves on, you put it in. You don't, you don't, like, don't worry about sterility, you know, you do your best, but really that's not, that, all those lines get changed out anyways when they go to the ICU within 24 hours. Uh, you'll get them changed out for, for uh, you change the cortices out that she just mentioned, big, and you put like a normal central line in. But um, that's just, you know, just to remind you, like trauma situations, things kind of change. Your goal is to uh, keep that patient alive. Uh, so just that's where you want, this is like ideal placement right at the tip of the cable atrial junction. Um, Nothing else to say about that, I don't think. Uh, so this is about putting perm caps. These are really in the operating room using fluoro. Um, you'll do plenty of perm caps on vascular, but you can see you use a dilator or a tonneting device to go under the skin, over the over the clavicle, um, and then the catheter gets put into the IJ vein. Not relevant. I don't know what that is. Uh, a big thing, the hospital makes a big deal about central line infections, um, just like they do about catheter-associated inf infections. So it's a big topic. So, um, you know, they go through this whole protocol of changing the, the dressings every so often days. And um, But just when you round in the patients, they have a central line, just look at them. You know, make sure there's not, like, a bunch of redness around it. Sometimes you walk in there, and their dressing is, like, doing this and it's just flopping into it. So that's not okay. So you gotta um, just keep an eye on those things. Um, um, so usually when you take out a port, usually the port or perm cap, you take them out for, for cause they have a, a bacteremia, usually they'll wait until you have a negative blood culture before putting a new one. Um, that's all any of this says. I uh, remember staff's the most common cause of any central line infections. Uh, so these are the, 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 so this right here, is, this is actually uh, a vas calf, uh, a short one, it's a 15 centimeter probably, just a big vas calf. Um, little arterial lines, let's see. Uh, art lines, um, so in the trauma bay, the red shirts pretty much do all the art lines because they like to do them and they're helpful. And, but I would talk to them and have them teach you how they do it um, and get practice. Because when you're in the ICU you will, next year, you will do a lot of art lines and they are one of the most painful things that you will do in residency. They are not fun to do and the more practice, the more experience you have with them, the better chance you are 
going to have of actually being able to do it. Uh, this obviously goes to say, before you do anything, make sure you actually know what you're doing. Uh, this is like a shortened one. Hmm. All right. Any questions about any of that stuff? Yeah. So like how many times the other day we had a guy we were trying to do a fast cast on and tried past the wire three separate times, mm -hmm. couldn't get it. So then we tried it three times, couldn't get it. So then we switched over to the left. Mm -hmm. Is that like a reasonable? Yeah. So I, I wouldn't put a, a, a number on it because it, it just depends on the patient and why you think that you're having trouble getting through is, you know, um, a lot of that's just going to come with experience, just experience, it's, it's knowing when you just have to give up. Like sometimes you just do like, okay, let me go to the other side. Um, you know, if you feel like, like, you know, I did one recently, the one that I, that I was saying that I was terrible because I went to the right IJ. It was actually me and Moss were doing it. He had, you know, we had trouble even accessing the vein. And we accessed the vein, and the wire wouldn't thread. So then there's a lot going on there. Then um, as opposed to somebody who may has a giant vein, you're accessing it fine, and then you're just having trouble with the wire. It just, it just depends on the situation, really, how, how the patient's tolerating it. Um, um, but usually if, if you can't get the wire across after one or two tries, you're probably not going to be able to. And you should never force the wire through. The wire should slide. Slide easily. The situations where you have a little resistance, and that's okay, but you should never be forcing it. If you're forcing it, that's when bad things happen. You can easily put a hole in the, in the vein, um, put a hole in the heart. Uh, so um, just be mindful of that. Uh, always also, when you, when you get that wire in, and this is from personal experience, it, make sure if they're on a monitor, you're looking at that monitor. And if you start seeing funny things on that rhythm, uh, you pull that wire back. Just pull it back until you don't see funny things anymore, okay? Um, we have a habit of just hubbing that wire and just putting it all the way in so we don't lose it. Um, but then that's, that just coils in the heart. You don't really need to. You really only need about that much of the wire actually in there. But we put, like, this much. Um, but I, I had a patient uh, go into cardiac arrest doing a central line because the wire was probably too far in. So it was a sick person, but, but I'm just saying bad things can happen uh, doing this. So... Keep that in mind. All right, let's uh, look at these tips real quick.
This is what the kit looks like. There's some there's lidocaine here normally in the kit as well. That's called this chloride kit. The atrium does not come in here. That's separate. Yes, it comes with this. It comes with this crappy petroleum gun. You gotta get your hands yeah. here. Uh, another thing you, that doesn't come in here that you need is a chill, is a soft soap. Sorry, it's a soft soap. Okay. Soft soap is the future of the Number two. The number two. Big, big giant needle, big zombie, big It comes with. Yeah, I know. It comes with red. If you try tying a chest tube with this, you're either gonna break it or the tube will come out. Or the tube. It's not actually gonna be here. Is it number two? You got for soft. It's literally an SOF. Where do you get those? The ER has them. They're not the ER. They're in the basement. They're in the basement. The ER. You're not really going to find them. If you're going to do one on the floor, you're going to have to get it for after the order. You're not going to have it. So, Kelly. Kelly is like a denier. It's like the lowest you go. Size one, size nine. Yeah, I would say. Yeah. I would have to do that. Are you guys, are you guys still doing that, that stupid?